Okay. Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to a special pre-conference session prior to our Library 2.017 Makerspaces event. We're so excited about this. Sue Considine and Mike Samino are here. Hope I've said your names correctly from Fayetteville Free Library. Welcome to the two of you. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Special thanks to San Jose State University School of Information, Follett, Wiz IQ, and Badge List. You can get digital badging for these sessions. So do go to the library20.com website and you can follow up with that if you're interested in getting some kind of digital certification for attending. Those of you who are in the room, many of you have been putting in your locations. Feel free to continue to do that. I know we've got Australia, Africa, Canada, the United States. We need South America, you some Asia. Let us know. Okay, and I'm gonna click over now to your presentation, Mike and Sue, and let you get started. Okay, great. All right. In here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone. I'm Sue Considine here with Mike Samino. We are the FFL. We're so happy to have the opportunity to be here with all of you today. Two quick housekeeping points. This session will be archived, so please don't feel like you have to scramble to take down notes. And also, Mike and I will be facilitating Q&A at the end. Uh, please post your questions in the chat box throughout, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of our presentation. So over the past six years, we've been gratified and overwhelmed by the response both in and outside of our industry about our activities here at the FFL. However, as you can imagine, we also found ourselves without the capacity to spend the time that's requested of us. For instance, the enormous amount of calls, emails, drop-in visits with people asking for just a minute of our time and then saying, tell me everything. So recognizing that this professional sharing and learning together is of the highest priority to us, we did two things. First, we developed www.fflib.org forward slash make, which is a comprehensive learning portal featuring FAQs, resources, links, program ideas, and so much more. Also, we planned for on-site innovation tours these tours go as deeply into the FFL service and philosophies as a visitor would like. Typically, we host librarians, graduate students, educators, professionals in STEM fields, manufacturing professionals, and more. But it's never enough. Many have asked us to develop a virtual tour. So today, we will share with you our very first pilot, very rough pilot, of a virtual tour featuring Mike, and uh, featuring focusing on our digital creation lab and our FFL Fab Lab. This video is 12 minutes long, so please hang in with us. Take note of any questions or ideas you have to share, and we'll address them during Q&A at the end of the PowerPoint presentation after the video. If you lose our connection to the video, please visit our Fay Free, F-A-Y-F-R-E-E, Fay Free YouTube page, the title of the video is Fayetteville Free Library Makerspace Tour. Here we go. I'll post the, um, the YouTube link one more time if, if we lose you along the way. And uh, here we go. Hi, my name is Mike Samino. I am Director of Steam and Making at the Fayetteville Free Library. Uh, today we're going to take a little tour of our maker spaces. Uh, there's a couple that they comprise of. This one right now we are in the Creation Lab. The Creation Lab is a 250 square foot uh, space that we have in our team, just off of our team area. Uh, this was our where we first housed our first two 3D printers. Uh, they were ones that were donated to us from a local computer printer supply company. At that time, we did one-on-one -on -one trainings and things like that in this space. This was our interim before we got into our larger fab lab space. Uh, we have on this in this space we have two Macs, two PCs. They're both loaded with software for video editing, uh, photo editing. They also have Adobe Photoshop on the two PCs, and then 
behind us here we also have a green screen wall with softbox lights to do proper video creation. We currently have it so that you can check out video equipment at the front desk to use the space and uh, use that, that equipment outside of our library as well. So it's not just uh, for use in this, in this space or the library. This is an unstaffed space and uh, patrons can come in and drop in to use this space. Now this space here is our fab lab or fabrication lab. This was a portion of the building was renovated in 2013 and it is around 2,500 square feet. This space here really holds all the tools and equipment and technology uh, like a sewing machines, laser cutter, CNC mill, 3D printers, uh, vinyl cutter, Cricut cutter, Ellison machine, some hand tools. To access this space um, and to use this space, it's free of charge for our patrons. Certain uh, tools and equipment just have a consumable material cost, like the 3D printer where it's five cents a gram. But things like the laser cutter and the sewing machines, they have no cost associated with them. So you can use the laser cutter, bring in your own material, no cost to use that. We'll begin with that and we'll go take a look at that uh, laser cutter and we'll go around the room to tour some of the other equipment. So in this corner here, this is our Zing laser, Avalaz laser. This allows you to cut on all sorts of different material. Uh, this is a 50 watt CO2 power machine. We can do things on wood, we can do things on glass, acrylic, slate, we could do marbleized or painted brass and aluminum, uh, leather. And this computer, we have software like CorelDRAW, Inkscape, um, some other SVG editors, scalable vector graphic editors, because that's how the machine here uh, can print lines. It'll draw or cut lines. And then it can raster or engrave images as well. Some examples you could see here. The um, machine has been uh, uh, really become very, very popular. It was something that our community was looking to have access to uh, about two years ago. Uh, so we ended up looking into different brands and things like that. The, uh, this machine has made all sorts of stuff from personalized uh, gifts, whether it's a cutting board, it's done glassware, personalized gifts. It's done a lot of prototyping of gears, which you could cut out with Delrin. So Delrin uh, uh, plastic. You could also do things with acrylics, uh, plexiglass, uh, and um, also name cards or, or uh, labeling, labeling machinery and things like that. Very popular machine in our fab lab. So now this machine here, this is our CNC mill. This is a computer numeric controlled mill. Uh, that means that we have a small Arduino and that is controlling a bunch of servos and that will move this router spindle around in uh, very precise um, um, modes here. And it's all in a, um, using a software that you can design your own uh, designs with. We use a program called Easel. It's web-based. It's very simple for people to use, so you don't have to have a background in engineering or mechanical engineering or anything like that. You don't have to know even what CNC stands for. But uh, in that case here, it uh, knows all the things to run the machine properly. You just input your material size and depth, uh, let it know what size the end mill or bit is, and pretty much upload your graphic. You can design in here, but we really uh, see that most people are designing with different software than they imported here and they can make all sorts of stuff. We've seen people make some really cool uh, clock faces. The uh, one patron was using this to make a clock face. It was R2D2 and all the hour and minute hands and then all the graphics around the clock face. That was a kind of neat application for it. A lot of people use it for sign making too. You could use that to cut out all the uh, letters. We can do things with brass, aluminum, uh, very thin stock aluminum. We could do uh, the computer boards so we can mill off all the copper contacts so you can make a PCB board out of this. 
Uh, you could also do plexiglass and things like that. But we primarily see people using it for wood um, and some metals there. Next, what we'll do is we'll go over and take a look at the 3D printers in the family. Now, in this portion of our fab lab, we have along our exterior wall, we have seven 3D printers. Primarily, we use the MakerBot Replicator 2. We use PLA plastic. Uh, we use that because of the ease of printing for this model. And by keeping it all PLA, it keeps our parts very consistent and keeps the experience that our patrons have uh, pretty consistent as well. So with this, we do have it so that a person can use a machine, a patient can use a machine one at a time. They uh, do not have a time limit or anything like that. One thing that we do implement here is a ticketing system. So when you are using a machine like this one, the patron will fill out a ticket slip that uh, says that they'll pick this up later. Uh, they put down their phone number and their name, uh, description of the part, and then which machine that they're using, and we'll keep that on file over there. Once the part's done, we take the part off of the plate to allow another patron to come on to use it, and then we store those into uh, storage bins so that the patron can come back in, they can say, oh, okay, I was printing on R4, it was a red part, and we can pick it up. We weigh them um, with a little food scale after they've been printed, and we charge five cents per gram of plastic. That like, covers the cost of the plastics for us with a little bit of extra there so that we can cover any kind of cost, whether the machine uh, messes up or uh, people take off the wraps or support material that are, um, that's being built onto the part itself. So we have that little cushion for loss there. One thing that we saw um, when we first opened, we did not have this many machines. We've grown with the, the demand of our community and our patrons. And that also led us to get into having an option for ABS printing. So we do have one Mojo machine through Stratasys. And that Mojo machine uh, prints an ABS. It's a tougher plastic. It is a smaller build volume than these. But uh, it allows you to print pretty much anything that you can imagine uh, without the need to, or concern for support material and orientation. It pretty much prints anything that you need it in any orientation you want. And we also have, so we have that one that was a little different pricing structure for that one uh, to cover the costs associated with that. Next, what we'll do is we'll go on a little bit around the corner here. We'll go on to our vinyl cutting and our cricket cutting area uh, to show you that equipment. Now in this station here, this is our vinyl cutter station, which also has our cricket machine and a laminator. The vinyl cutting machine allows you to cut uh, vinyl adhesive stock uh, up to 19 inches wide on a, this, uh, really it's a, a point plotter that has a cutting bit to it. Uh, and people can make signs and graphics and decals and all sorts of things. It is um, something that we charge for just the consumable part. So you just pay for the adhesive of vinyl that you uh, want to select, or you can bring in your own, and then there's no cost. So now in this corner of the, our space here, we do have a uh, sewing corner. We have a large uh, portion of our community here that is into sewing. So this is all volunteer-led. We didn't know anything about sewing. Uh, they were the ones that informed us about it and helped us in creating the, the training module for this. We do have um, a total of eight sewing machines with a couple that we'll pull out in reserve for programs and things like that. We have some uh, lighting uh, for uh, patients that are sewing and things like that. We also have the ironing boards, we have all the thread, we have scissors, bobbins, any uh, cutting mats, rotary cutters, anything that they may need to uh, create whatever they're working on. Kind of panning over a little bit, uh, you'll see that we do have some Connects kits, uh, Snap Circuits. These are uh, different STEM kits that we have that can be loaned out to homeschool and teachers. Um, we also have some reference material there. And then a little bit further off to the right, our newest addition there, we do have a, an Oculus Rift that you can uh, experience virtual reality in 20 minute kind of intervals to sign out for. We have a variety of different uh, uh, games and sculpting uh, programs that you can use. 
where we do have the, the hand grips as well. So uh, there's more interactiveness to that virtual reality. The last thing what we'll do is we'll go over to our tool and craft wall and, and show you what's there. And in this final section here, this is our crafting area. We do have uh, different crafts that are donated, some that we have a, um, we budget for as well. Um, and it includes like jewelry making tools, large paper, smaller paper, stamps, yarn, markers, crayons, scissors, all that stuff that uh, kids, families, uh, teens can come in to create uh, whatever they, they want. A little bit farther over, we do have a little bits wall full of all different little bits uh, arranged in those red, blue, and yellow bins. And then continuing on, we have our tools, our hand tools. They range from wrenches and socket sets and screwdrivers and hammers and first aid kit, and uh, we got some cleaning supplies as well. So this concludes our tour. Stay with us for the live portion of our presentation now. So uh, thank you for joining us on our first pilot of a virtual tour. Um, give us any feedback that you would like. Um, uh, we're looking forward to taking that pilot and uh, professionalizing it and um, expanding, to, expanding it to other areas of the library as well. So Mike, great job, thanks so much. The topics we're gonna cover today include why making in libraries is a perfect fit and natural evolution of our services, strategies for getting started, administrative considerations, and all of the topics you see on the slide here. We'll work very hard to save 15 minutes for Q&A and discussion at the end. Please note that our contact information is on the first screen and please reach out to us after today if you have additional or more in-depth questions. We'd love to hear from you. We'll answer them in the end. Okay, so why? Why is making a direction our library and so many others are choosing to embrace as part of their core? Why are collaborative experiential learning spaces becoming a requirement of all new library planning or existing facility renovations? Why are we hiring people with diverse skill sets such as engineering, design, instruction, computer science, robotics? Why are we looking out into our communities for people who have talent and enthusiasm and skill sets that we can leverage to bring our community members more learning opportunities? Why are our collections becoming more visible around the perimeter of active spaces in our organizations? Why? Because libraries are a key component to any successful learning ecosystem in any community. Libraries are in a unique position to provide access to and to facilitate learning that is user-defined, interest-driven, experimental, and fun. Most public libraries have a mission statement, some sort of guiding idea that's a benchmark for all activity, budgeting, planning. Ours is to provide free and open access to ideas and information. Simple and elegant by design, but when implemented at its fullest, profoundly impactful. It's our job to test any new idea that bubbles up in our organization against this mission statement before moving forward. Certainly, making was a concept that we found to be a natural extension of our mission and existing role in our community. If we were to develop a makerspace and related programming, we would be the only organization locally to provide free and open access to maker technologies and the boundless information, skills, and possibilities that they can unlock when combined with one key ingredient, people. We understood that as a public library, we are uniquely positioned in the center of any community to bring people together regardless of economic or social standing, age, race, gender, level of education, or any other factors, to think together, to connect, to share knowledge, and more compelling, to create new knowledge. As Neil Gershenfeld of the Center of MIT, Center for Bits and Atoms stated, the power of fabrication is social, not technical. Interpreted in our public library, this means 
a 3D printer or a laser cutter or a sewing machine do not create maker culture in a library or community. People do. People do through their connections around things that they're passionate about or inspired by. We also saw the potential for making to play an important role towards our existing goals related to 21st century literacy skills development, lifelong learning, and community building. Like many public libraries, our library strives to offer services and resources to help community members develop, develop the literacy, literacy skills they need to thrive in the modern world and economy. And no longer is literacy limited to understanding and utilizing print and information. A literate person must now possess a wide range of abilities and competencies, many literacies, including fluency with the tools of technology, digital literacy, and STEM literacy skills. These types of skills need to be honed through, through hands-on learning. We saw that making could provide a new hands-on means to these ends, allowing people to develop the skills they need to start their own business, to get an invention crowdfunded, to land jobs in high demand industries such as engineering, manufacturing, computer science, and gain the problem solving and creative thinking and teamwork skills needed in modern life. Gotta go the other way. Hey Steve, I'm not sure if your mouse is hovering over the next button, but I can't quite get the next button going. There we go, yeah. thank you. All right. As informal learning institutions, libraries have a unique opportunity to engage learners on their own terms. Studies have shown that for students, early interest in pursuing physical science or engineering careers is a better predictor of whether they will follow through with those careers than compared to peers with the higher achievement but lower levels of interest. Curiosity and enjoyment of science starting early in life has also been shown to be integral to increase continued engagement with STEM activities over one's lifetime. So it's up to libraries who have no lesson plans to follow or tests to prepare for to create fun, interest-driven, hands-on STEM learning opportunities for our patrons of all ages. Oh, sorry, Gino, I got it. So as expected, over the past six years, we've found that making is a terrific avenue through which our community members can create and share 21st century knowledge and skills in an informal, participatory, interest-driven way. Countless libraries across, across the country have since moved in this direction. In library makerspaces, patrons are inventing, innovating, discovering, and developing new solutions. The end result of embracing making at our library has been strengthening not only the library, but strengthening our community as a whole. So how did we get to where we are today? What are some of the key strategies we employed in order to successfully develop makerspaces and related maker programs? As with the development of any new service or program, the important thing is to start with your particular community's needs and priorities in mind. What community goals will your maker program seek to meet? What gaps will it seek to fill? What programs and services are your community members asking you for? And what are they looking for? Once these intended outcomes are established, the key is to start, start somewhere. While you may have an enormous vision of all of the things you eventually will want in your space and all the programs you'll do there, you shouldn't feel like you have to wait to get started and, and until you've acquired every item you think you need and want. We found success with starting small, collecting evidence of success and needs being met, and then moving forward, building upon this success incrementally. We found that this strategy has been successful both for building the program in a manageable fashion, as far as resources are concerned, and also uh, building staff and community support, awareness and participation. Finally, a key for us has been to involve staff members across all areas of responsibility in our planning and all of our phases of development. So we'll share three quick examples where we identified community needs and priorities, then took small strategic steps 
implementing a maker initiative to meet that need and then collected evidence of the needs being met and finally expanding upon the program or the service area. Sewing and Lego Robotics are examples where members of our community explicitly told us they wanted these. With Lego Robotics, we had parents and grandparents approach us and say, there's nowhere locally for my child or grandchild to be involved in the first Lego team, which is a national competitive Lego Robotics League. With sewing, we had people asking if the library would ever consider hosting sewing classes, indicating that their kids were starting to learn sewing in school, but wanted somewhere to continue learning, or adults indicating they had a specific project they wanted to make or wanted to refresh their skills that they had learned earlier in life. And they were asking us, where can I go to do this? With Geek Girl Camp, this was an area where we identified gaps in access in our community, and we felt the library was uniquely situated to fill the gap based on our mission and existing role in the community. We knew that there was a strong interest in emerging technologies in our area. We knew that families in our area place a high value on academic excellence. We also knew that nowhere locally people could get um, access to digital fabrication technologies and learn how to utilize them to the fullest. Nor was there anywhere that girls in grades three through five could go for a low cost, immersive STEM camp experience where they not only develop STEM skills and interests through fun, hands-on activities, but we're also building interest and confidence in the areas of STEM careers through meeting and interacting with women in STEM fields. So in all three areas, having identified needs, we tested the waters, gathered evidence of community interest and impact, then we're positioned to confidently move farther ahead. An early and perennial uh, popular example is sewing. With sewing, testing and moving forward was as simple as putting a promotional piece on the back of the bathroom stalls in our library, asking people if they were interested in sewing, and if so, to let a staff member know. We had a tremendous number of people come forward looking to both learn and teach sewing and to donate fabric, supplies, and time. Huge enthusiasm in response. As a result, we acquired four $70 sewing machines, put them on a media cart we already had, and rolled them out for volunteer-led programs several times each month. We had such high attendance and interest that when we secured grant funding to develop a permanent fab lab space, we decided to develop a dedicated drop-in sewing area within the lab. With Lego Robotics, we began by holding a first Lego League interest meeting. Our community room was full, packed full of families interested in joining the team. This further confirmed that the need and the interest were there, so we started a team. And as of today, we've hosted five seasons of first Lego League. Indeed, we've seen such continual interest in the area of Lego Robotics, where we have had more kids interested in any given season than we can accommodate on the team. This led us to develop additional opportunities for robotics, including hosting our own standalone Lego Robotics Challenge programs once a month that we call Lego Brainstorms for grades three through five, Lego Mindstorms for grades six through nine, and more recently, we purchased Lego We Do kits and now run monthly Lego Robotics Challenges for grades K through two. These are so popular, over 25 kids sign up to attend each session. Finally, we've also added a first tech challenge team, which is like the first Lego team, but for grades seven through 12. With Geek Girl, we said, we'll start with a pilot year. We'll offer a STEM camp for girls in grades three through five during our summer learning program. We had 44 girls sign up for the pilot and an equal number on our waiting list. So again, we could clearly see we were moving in the right direction. With the success of Geek Girl, initially, we had countless numbers of parents wanting a similar option for boys. Our staff was set in motion to research what that opportunity might look like. In 2016, we held our first STEAM camp for boys. Every year, we filled our quota of campers within the first day of registration. With Geek Girl, we started with 44 girls, four groups, or 11 girls. In years two and three, we increased to 48, 
and this year we accepted 52 girls. In fact, this year we opened in-person only registration on 6 p.m. the first Monday in April and we filled up with 52 girls in 26 minutes. We're now already beginning to plan for our summer of 2018 STEAM camps. Our community response is overwhelming. If your first steps with making are done with the approach just described, we found this can solve many issues related to staff members and stakeholders being on board. If our people can clearly see and experience evidence of success with initial starter initiatives, they'll have fuller understanding and a sense of their piece in the developing success when you begin to expand your initiatives. If you're planning maker programs to meet community needs, there will naturally be many people in your audience who inherently understand the value of what you're doing and will get behind it. We involve our people from across all areas of responsibility and often, and often with the development of all of our maker programming initiative services. Doing so just makes sense since making has implications for everything from collections to technology, from training to patron services, and includes all audiences from kids to adults. By providing regularly scheduled opportunities for people to share ideas and contribute, no one feels like making is something that's happening in a vacuum, something that they don't understand or has nothing to do with them. At our library, we accomplish this by holding uh, making and STEAM forums that meet once a month where we discuss everything making and STEAM at the FFL. Professional staff from across primary areas of responsibility are required to attend, and everyone has an equal opportunity to share ideas and weigh in on creative development related to our maker spaces, programs, collections, and services. Through the forum, everyone is informed and involved with everything. Making is not seen as one person or one team's responsibility. Development is a shared full team effort and everyone holds a shared stake in our shared success. As you're getting started, there are some administrative elements to consider. This is not the fun, creative, sexy stuff. This is the functional compliance and safety stuff. As you determine what you want your maker initiatives to look like, it's critical to be talking with your local experts and authorities along the way. If you plan to introduce a new tool or technology into the space, you'll need to work with your local co codes enforcer or um, uh, to make sure you're in compliance. You'll need to discuss your plans with your liability insurance provider to make sure you're covered for the types of activities that will be happening in the space. These are critical steps to ensure that your maker spaces A will open and B will stay open. Finally, it's important to have a plan for success. If your initial making attempts go well and you do find evidence of a need and desire for growth in this area, what are some strategies and approaches you can take to grow your overall budget to meet these identified needs? Where will we build new capacity within our budget? How will we seek to develop relationships to accomplish this? Some of the strategies we've used to help us find the funds and resources to move forward are as follows. Resource reallocation has become a critical strategy for us to allow making to become sustainable as part of our mission. We'd like to point out that the majority of items that, we've, that we have in our maker spaces were purchased from dollars that already existed. We reallocated and shifted in order to make current community needs a priority. The majority of our maker spaces and maker activities are taking place in the physical spaces we had available to us. And we did not hire additional staff to staff our maker spaces here are two specific strategies we've embraced for finding funds, staff time, and space for making within what we already had. One strategy was to rethink our programming budget. By opening up the library as a platform for community members to share what they know with their neighbors, we've been able to move away from paying experts to give lectures and presentations, the result of which has allowed us to reallocate a substantial percentage of our programming budgets towards making and STEAM initiatives. 
we've similarly moved away from paying performers to deliver children's programming. And instead, we invest in STEM kits, technologies, and tools that can be used over and over and over again in scheduled programs, as well as on a drop-in basis. A second strategy was to perform an in-depth reference assessment in order to make better informed decisions about service desk staffing and reference materials purchasing. We collected lots of information and utilized uh, several tools, including Gimlet, a free online tool, to determine what times of day we were getting the most questions, what types of questions we were being asked, what resources we were using to answer these questions and more. The result of this assessment has been that we could confidently determine what to stop doing, what was no longer valuable or a good use of our time or our resources. To be able to start doing more in identified areas of value and re relevance such as making. For us, this has allowed us to make confident decisions about making changes to service desk staffing, databases and reference materials purchasing, allowing us to free up valuable staff time and money to pursue what's next. Partnerships can play a critical role in acquiring things you need for your maker initiatives. Grant opportunities and awards can help you get your maker initiatives off the ground or help you expand your current successes. And again, uh, the most important consistent question what can we stop doing to be able to reallocate our existing budget, physical spaces, and staff time? These are questions that shouldn't happen just once or twice a year when you're looking at your budgets. These conversations can be happening at all levels, candidly and continuously through formal and informal assessment. All right, so here are a few examples of the mutually beneficial partnerships and collaborations that uh, we've seen. Hopefully these examples will get you thinking about all of your possibilities. Back in 2010, when we began to understand that making was the direction our community wanted us to go, we approached a local computer company called Express Computer Services for a donation of our first 3D printer. The printer was one that had to be assembled so how do you put one together when very few people even know what a 3D printer is? We looked to our community and uh, Syracuse University students helped to put this machine together. Indeed, our relationship with our local colleges and universities has proven to be invaluable uh, for numerous reasons. Students have ideas that are cutting edge knowledge, enthusiasm and, and time and they are looking to gain experience. Many programs of study require volunteer hours or internships. We can serve as a place where they can take their ideas and enthusiasm and parlay them into something concrete. We can offer them a real world experience they're looking for, while they can bring fresh vision and knowledge to projects and move our programs forward. Once 3D printing was available and popular at the FFL, uh, supporting 3D computer aided design was the next logical direction we wanted to move in. In our community, there was a significant group of CAD users, including students, engineers, manufacturers, and hobbyists. Through informal and formal conversations, we found that multiple local manufacturing businesses purchased CAD software through the same retailer. We approached this company and they donated us a lab license to SolidWorks. It's a professional 3D modeling software used by many engineers. I'll try and speak, uh, okay, I'll try and speak up there. Uh, so we approached that company. For the past several years, not only has this retailer offered group classes on the software at the library, but we've also had community volunteers uh, training other patrons on this software. Our volunteers include everyone from young mechanical engineers looking um, to boost their resumes to retired engineers looking to keep their skills fresh and contribute in the economy. Thanks to this part uh, partnership, we have everyone from young kids to seniors learning how to create their own 3D models at the library. In another example, we were approached by a company called Webucated, and with, uh, which is a national online technology learning company based in Syracuse. Members of their staff were familiar with the offerings of our library that we had here, and they came to us offering a means offering to offer our patrons free access to their self-guided courses on technology topics such as Adobe software. 
we had recognized this as a need for our patrons and uh, were experiencing, so we were eager to uh, partner with them. We've since helped Webucator advance their initiative and ours as well. Uh, called this, li this library partner program, which allows any library to distribute voucher codes so that the patrons can have free access to their online courses. This is a win-win for libraries like ours and Webucator since libraries get to offer this great free content to their patrons and Webucator gets to expand their reach and get their name out there, hopefully gaining the attention of corporate clients looking to purchase in-person training. Obviously, partnering with local businesses and organizations as well as national industry vendors has been critical for gaining not only the things we've needed, but also tapping into the local expertise and new audiences we were looking to reach. Through our partnerships, we've been able to pilot new learning tools, services, and products, and provide direct feedback to vendors and businesses in order to help them remain relevant and help us gain access to the types of products we need to support in our mission. Our partnership with Broadart is another example of this. Through meetings, discussions, and tours of our spaces, we've helped Broadart get in touch with the goals and needs of a 21st century library. We hope our relationship can help a company like Broadart stay viable in the, uh, in the needs of a 21st century um, library business. And that we can turn to them as a relied upon vendor for our needs rather than trying to seek out solutions from Amazon or go on a wild goose chase for items that we need, which sometimes don't even exist. Finally, there are for profit major spaces, incubators, tech meetup groups. These are also great organizations to reach out and develop mutually beneficial relationships with. Maybe a maker meetup group exists in your community and you can provide them with a new venue where they can meet plus promotions. Maybe a tech incubator has a listserv to post your volunteer opportunities. Maybe you want to partner with a for-profit makerspace so you could provide referrals to each other's complimentary classes or programs and services. Maybe a local high school has regular internship projects that they're looking to, for host sites. And any and all of these are examples of simple ways to develop a mutually beneficial relationship uh, to help move your maker initiatives forward. Of the many questions and sticking points we often get asked regarding making are related to the policies and procedures. So what policies do we have in effect in our library related to making? How have we been able to implement making in ways that minimize potential risks to the library? You can find all of our policies and procedures at www.sflid forward slash make. If you don't find what you're looking for, contact us. Here, uh, before any patron uses the equipment in our Fab Lab, they must sign off on our Fab Lab Maker Agreement. And this agreement can be found on our website at fflib.org forward slash maker FAQs. That's fflib.org forward slash maker FAQs. The agreement is a three page document that we developed based on agreements utilized in many commercial maker spaces. So here you can see a longer list of that backside of that maker agreement. Some of the key points to highlight include that whenever a patron enters the space, they, can, uh, they have to check in with a staff member at the desk. We scan the card, their library card, to make sure that they have signed the maker agreement. If they haven't yet, we get them to sign one there. Another important point is to make uh, that our makers must participate in mandatory safety trainings. We call them certifications. Uh, these include things like the 3D printer, the laser cutter, the CNC mill, sewing machines, and vinyl cutter. Uh, they may not use these tools until this training has been completed. We require makers under the age of nine to be accompanied by an adult in the space. Older kids can be in the space unsupervised, but they must be accompanied by a parent or a caregiver or a guardian to use certain pieces of equipment. For instance, a maker under the age of 16 must be accompanied by a parent or guardian in order to use the laser cutter or the CNC mill or the mojo printer, soldering irons, rotary cutters, uh, sharp cutting tools. These sharp tools are stored in a staff only cabinet that, that are available upon request. I'll point out that this is a living document 
and it's something that we've added to and it's altered over time. Another question we get often is related to staffing. How do we staff our makerspace and programs and how do we handle staff training? Our overall goal in training when it comes to staff and volunteer uh, is not to require everyone to have an expert level of knowledge on all the equipment in the lab. That would be unrealistic, it's unreasonable. Our goal really is to, for all staff to have a basic understanding of how the equipment or machine or the program works and some basic troubleshooting tips. If a patron has a more in-depth question about a machine or a program that we have, us, they can, um, that the staff member can't, uh, hasn't been trained to answer, they can either look it up, uh, much like we do this with traditional reference questions, but they could also ask a member of the staff, such as the IT team, for an answer, or more often than not, they could set up the patron for a one-on-one -on -one appointment where, with a staff member or a skilled volunteer where uh, they get much more specialized help. Initial training of new staff members and volunteers all undergo six hours of training during which they become certified on all the equipment in the fab lab. We have found it works best to do this in cycles. So if we have a new batch of support and staff members or volunteers starting in the fall, what we'll do is train them all together. Once training has been completed, there's always a backup for new staff and volunteers in the form of the librarian on the main reference desk. Should a question arise, they can always give them a call. We also have lots of supporting materials available in the fab lab including training manuals, step-by-step uh, -step training guides, a checklist for using each machine. And training on, all, uh, on a new piece of equipment or to keep our uh, knowledge fresh, our professional staff members will uh, attend mandatory maker and STEAM forums once a month, during which we have these extra training opportunities, these refreshers. One thing that makes these forums training opportunities so successful is that the topics are identified and chosen by the staff member. If a staff member feels uncomfortable with their level of knowledge on a service being offered here, they can bring it to one of our forums and have a training opportunity scheduled. Uh, this seems to work really well because everyone needs a refresher at some point in order to keep their confidence up as they're working with this equipment. Here's an example of one of our training, uh, the trainer checklists here. In order to make sure that the every staff member is trained at the same basic level, we've developed these training checklists to serve as an outline for every training we provide for the staff. Uh, staff can use these checklists as a reference uh, for any time that they're, they're um, working with a patron training. Um, they, this then ensures that whenever you go to me or anyone else for training, your experience is relatively the same, and you're getting all the information you need to be successful in your effort. Most importantly, we need to make sure that our patrons know how to use the equipment effectively. Our goal is not only to allow patrons to be able to learn and create safely, but to try to make the experience as frustration free as possible. So in each certification class, patrons learn how to operate the given machine safely, as well as uh, some tips on how to succeed with the machine. For instance, in a 3D printer certification, we will show the patron what to look for when selecting a model. Uh, to 3D print. If the model isn't set up correctly, the patron could end up with a big ball of plastic, stringy plastic, not satisfying. They won't, they'll be frustrated. We have tried all sorts of models to meet the local demand for certifications, and we have found that most fabrication uh, equipment certifications work quite well in a group setting, and this is because we're not getting people started on their individual projects, and we're simply showing them how the, some of the basic information is um, or the basic, I'm sorry, the basic information about how to, op to operate the machine. Going through the same checklist each time, we have also recently added an online certification option for 3D printing, laser cutting, and vinyl cutting certifications. They can now watch a video online and take a three question quiz to become certified. And on average, we see over 50 people a month using at least one of our online training modules. Finally, we can sign them up for a one on one. This time is with a librarian to get uh, certified, and the variety of options allow us to address various learning styles and meet the different needs of our patrons in our community, as well as better meet the demand. Of course, patrons sometimes ask questions that we don't know the answer to. When this happens, we take the approach of let's find out together. 
after all, we are librarians and we don't know everything, but we can find the information on anything. This is a mentality we build into staff training and reinforce frequently. After the training is complete, we make sure to provide the patron with easy access to the materials that they just learned. We provide these materials in the form of a bookmark, uh, videos, and links online to online resources. Of course, there's always someone at the desk uh, if they have a question that they, um, they can ask as well. Community participants are key. Community volunteers lead classes and appointments that allow our patrons to go beyond their basic level of knowledge on how to operate a machine to much more in-depth information on how to design a specific 3D model in SolidWorks or how to execute a specific sewing project like sewing um, JAMA pants, things like that, how to make specific projects in Photoshop uh, and more. These things go far beyond the expertise we as staff members support. Another key component of getting our maker programs off the ground has been community involvement. We truly believe that every community is filled with the talented and passionate individuals, the people who are often itching to get involved and share what they know about their neighbors, uh, with their neighbors. What they, uh, <laughs> we believe that the library's role is to serve as a platform, a place for these individuals to come together and connect with other like-minded Again, there's no way that we can be experts on every new tool, concept, or software out there around making, nor should we be. But, but most likely, there is a person or a business or an organization that does have the expertise in one area or another. And it's not our job as library staff members to know everything and teach every topic. It's our job as librarians to connect the people that want to know something with the resources that they need to learn those things whether those resources are text-based or online resources, tools, technologies, uh, classes, or other people. So how can you gather those great and talented community members? Well, going back as far as our maker open houses, when we first were hearing how eager people were to get involved, we began to make a targeted effort to capture those sorts of informal conversations we were having and allowing people to get involved and engage in deeply, deep, meaningful ways. Okay, so understanding that communities' aspirations and interests drive our agenda, we became very interested in the work of John McKnight and Peter Block, specifically their book, The Abundant Community. McKnight and Block suggest that every community has what it needs within the community. The key for us as libraries is to find ways to locate that talent and interest and expertise in the community, hook into it and engage with it. As a result of our examination of this concept, we developed a community engagement tool that we now feature in our public spaces and is used to capture this type of interest. And you see that form on the screen. This form serves as our volunteer application. When we're talking with someone who says, oh, sorry about that. I'll try to be closer to it. Um, okay, so when we're talking with someone who says, for example, I'm interested in what's going on here and I'd love to get involved. I'm a robotics enthusiast, for example. We use this tool to capture their enthusiasm and parlay that into involvement. Instead of our old volunteer model where we slotted people into roles we identified a need for, we now open up the library as a platform for community members to share their ideas and make meaningful connections. The direct result of community participants leading programs at our library has resulted in a new, more meaningful engagement. Community members are able to lead classes, clubs, programs, on an ever-growing wide variety of topics that result in significant savings of resources, both time and programming costs for staff. Together, we can do and provide more than we ever could alone. On the screen here, you can see examples of some of the many ways community members have gotten involved as volunteers in our Making and STEAM initiatives. 
we'd like to share some tools we've developed and used um, uh, for our maker initiatives to assess them and to build upon our successes. Constant formal and informal organization-wide assessment allows us to sustain and grow in directions that prove and bring value and continuous improvement to our community. In all of our assessment efforts, in all of our assessment efforts, what we're looking, uh, those pops are very <laughs> distracting. <laughs> in all of our assessment efforts, what we're looking for to illustrate our outcomes, not just how many people attend maker programs, but how did their skills, knowledge, and attitudes change as a result of their attendance and participation. Not just how many people were trained on or used 3D printers, but what were they able to accomplish as a result of this training and this access? How did their lives change? What are they doing with this new knowledge or these new skills? For us, it's about capturing not only the numbers, but also the stories that give the numbers their true meaning. So how do we do this? And yes, we'll give you links to all of our forms and policies and everything's on our website as well. So don't feel like you have to write anything down. On this screen is our FFL assessment tool available on our website. When we started with making, we, were, we very quickly began to see new types of impacts that we didn't anticipate really at all. We saw people using the library in new and groundbreaking ways. We saw that our programs, services, and spaces were now strengthening local small businesses, facilitating the development of inventions and innovations, causing local young people to get excited about STEM topics and deepen their STEM skills and so much more. We began thinking more critically about how to best capture these meaningful impacts. In doing so, we developed the assessment tool that we now use with initiatives across our library, including our maker programs and spaces. You'll notice the synergies between our assessment tool and a tool that I'll show you next, our proposal template. They are in fact, by design, two pieces of the same puzzle, where the proposal template encourages outcomes and impacts-based planning. The assessment tool ensures that once we've taken action, we're collecting the data that tells us what we really need to know. We're analyzing it in a way that clearly illustrates impact and we're identifying opportunities for growth and change. And so necessary, we're communicating results in a meaningful way to constituents and stakeholders. On the screen is our proposal template. This tool allows us to ensure that all of our program or service initiatives, including those related to making, are developed with community needs and outcomes at the forefront. Everything, everything at the FFL begins with a proposal. No longer are we saying, let's try something because it sounds cool or trendy or interesting. Instead, now we're able to say confidently, let's try this in order to achieve X result and in order to prove that we achieved X as a result, we're going to collect X pieces of information along the way. Both the proposal template and the assessment tool have a strong focus on data, both qualitative and quantitative. Next are a couple examples of ways we collect direct patron feedback. The one-on-one -on -one appointment survey that you see on the screen is one of the few targeted instances in which we utilize satisfaction surveys in our library. We have a great opportunity directly following a live training session where we have a captive audience and can ask them to fill this out to help us better adapt the trainings to meet their needs. Questions one through three, do you feel ready to use the equipment on your own? And do you feel confident in your ability to use the equipment safely? help us to ensure that we're providing adequate training and allows the respondent to tell their story. Did you get what you need? Moreover, this survey also helps indicate to us through question number four, how are you planning on using this knowledge, exactly what stands to be gained in the life of this person because of the access to this technology and training that we're providing. What did you learn and what will you do with it? Questions five through six help us to understand where the opportunities lie related to communications and promotions about our Fab Lab services. What marketing practices are effective in engaging people and getting people through the door? What's working? And most importantly, what's not? 
Finally, the FFL Capturing Stories is a tool and process that we've reimagined several times. Most recently, we adapted the great work of the St. John Fisher Library um, up here in upstate New York to create the online tool that you see on the screen. With our iteration of this tool, we capture the meaningful qualitative evidence, the stories that put an important context behind everything going on in our library and in our makerspaces and its impact on the lives of our community. We can confidently say that based on our event statistics, we know we've trained over 4,000 people or certified over 4,000 people on our Fab Lab equipment. But this number takes on much more meaning when we see the stories of how people are using the equipment and the space once they've gained the new skills. So when we have an informal conversation with someone who says something like, let me show you what I've been working on over the past couple of weeks. It's a prototype for a new invention. Um, I've got it perfected and now I'm using your digital creation lab to put together a video for Kickstarter or some other very meaningful impact. We use this form to capture the story, whether it's a written story blurb, a podcast, or a video for sharing out promotion, building awareness, and advocacy. We know that our staff members on our service, service desks throughout the library witness really cool things happening in the library every single day. Whether someone shares with them directly or they observe a unique experience, this tool allows all of us at the FFL to easily capture and share these impacts. All right, so what are some of the outcomes that we've seen through this process? How have uh, skills, abilities, attitudes, and lives been changed? Here's a couple of great pictures here. One of our first looks at entrepreneurship was with a young man uh, named Kane, who was about 12 years old. Uh, he's in the bottom center picture there. Kane decided he needed an equally impressive badge holder for all these of outstanding achievement badges he was uh, obtaining through the club DIY, uh, this DIY club, DIY.org. In the Fab Lab, Kane used, utilized an array of resources available to him, including the 3D design software, a laser cutter, and Kane created a design that could be cut on the laser cutter with exact precision instead of doing it all by hand as he was trying to do it before. Today, you can purchase his creation with uh, for your own DIY achievement badges on the organization's website. The man for Kane's badge holder grew so quickly that he had licensed the design to the DIY organization for production. And another example, Syracuse University had held a two day long conference focusing on student created tech startups. The conference was open to the public to gather interest and even investment opportunities. The FFL was invited to have a table at the conference, and while there, we stumbled upon an FFL patron who was a student at, at the conference. He had designed an iPad app driven by a toothbrush fitted with a gyroscope and a Bluetooth transmitter and a motor. Altogether, this new product would allow kids to play a game on their iPad while ensuring that they didn't miss a spot brushing their teeth. What was so amazing about this product was that the inventor had made all of his product designs and even the toothbrush holder itself using the Fab Lab equipment. And another example, a student named Jeremy developed bike rules while visiting our Fab Lab. Bike rules was a 3D printed turn signal that attached to the handlebars of a bike. And Jeremy has since made his invention smarter by adding GPS functionality to it. Now the GPS can log and track your trip using Bluetooth. In addition to the individual entrepreneurs, the Fab Lab also supports the efforts of local small businesses. Many companies in the area have found that we can be a valuable resource and they in turn often end up sharing their expertise with us and with our patrons. For instance, Hollowick is a local small business that produces tabletop lighting for restaurants. They have used our Fab Lab to prototype new product designs. Ephesus is a local startup that creates LED stadium lighting. Earlier in their development as a company, they came to the Fab Lab to use our 3D printers to build miniature prototypes of some of their products. They have since uh, have gone on to sell their stadium lights to hundreds of sports arenas, including dozens of NHL and NFL stadiums, and they even lighting the 2016 Super Bowl. 
To simulate these, uh, to stimulate these unique relationships, we host innovation tours on a regular basis where groups come in to our space and learn about what's possible. These groups may be other libraries interested in bringing making to their libraries, but just as often these tours are requested by schools, educators, museums, businesses. For instance, Upstate Medical, a local teaching hospital, came and toured our space to determine what, what these new technologies could mean for them and ended up scanning and printing a brain stem and anatomical models for use in their neuroscience student with their newer neuroscience students. Then at NIH, National Institute of Health, approached us about featuring their new 3D print exchange tool in our space. And this tool is essentially a repository for creating, sharing, and downloading 3D printable models. High Tech Rochester is a local company who toured the, uh, the Fab Lab to learn from us in the efforts to develop a makerspace specifically geared as an incubator for startups in the nearby city of Rochester, New York. CAD Dimensions, a local 3D printer reseller and a CAD consultant that has donated 10 copies of SolidWorks for our Fab Lab. And local area high schools have toured our space, then developed makerspaces of their own, and countless libraries from across the area and around the world have done the same. So what can coll uh, collaborations and partnerships look for you? Remember, just like your maker programs, your partnerships will be unique to the communities and talent strengths, your communities and Developing maker initiatives at our library has resulted in the support of skills and interest development in all demographics and in all areas as, as seen on this slide. Oh, Going back sure. to the previous slide, this one. I think it's important to see the diversity in all of these areas, um, content areas including archaeology, architecture, astronomy, biology, chemistry, computer science, construction, design, digital media production, digital fabrication, ecology, electronics, engineering, geometry, manufacturing, math, physics, programming, robotics supporting skills develop, development and those essential uh, uh, 21st century skills like problem solving, teamwork, critical thinking, creativity, and most importantly, making STEM topics and careers fun, interesting, cool, and accessible. Yeah, so on this slide here, there are a couple programs and examples that we do here at the uh, um, and you could also take a look through our website again, fflib.org. Uh, you can check out all the uh, content and materials we've been talking about. Um, some of the things here, like uh, if we were to talk about, uh, let's talk about, uh, we could do, how about young engineers? Young engineers, um, this program here is really catered towards the K through second grade demographic. Uh, this one here focuses on all sorts of things, whether it's coding with beads, so you're doing um, binary uh, bracelets. Um, coming up with our um, computer science week in December, they're going to be doing all computer science um, uh, uh, focus, doing some more coding again. Um, things on here like our robotics and electronics club, those are both volunteer led uh, clubs. They're, they started with uh, a volunteer that staffed the Fab Lab and has since now, um, those, those clubs run on their, on their own. We facilitate this space. Um, and they get to utilize the, uh, the equipment in the, in the fab lab, things like that. Our home repair, uh, that was also started by a volunteer. It was the idea there was a, um, a, a local volunteer here had been working as a remodeler and doing some things on the side and said, hey, why, why not do a home repair class on the basics of fixing drywall? Or how, do, you know, how does your light switch and uh, electrical outlets work? So, that has um, become a five-part series that we do every season, every um, season, and if it fills up right away. What we do is we cover electrical repair, um, drywall repair, plumbing, and then exterior interior maintenance. Okay, so just quickly, um, before we get to Q&A, we wanted to point out that so many of our projects, project ideas, lesson plans, and even software utilized for making, are available for free, free. So 
uh, take a look at this slide. Again, this is going to be available to you in an archived form. And remember to visit www.ffliv.org forward slash make. Um, in addition, consider visiting and joining smilecop.org. This is a new online community of practice, STEAM and making in informal learning environments. It's free, uh, free, again, it's free, and the in participation level is entirely up to you. Um, join and share and learn from people both in and outside of our industry, uh, libraries and education. And um, let's keep moving this agenda forward. We want libraries to have a permanent spot at the table in these important discussions about moving STEM learning forward at the community level. So thanks so much for making time in your busy day to hear from us. And now we want to hear from you. Um, is Steve moderating our chat? Uh, or? Steve's fine. Okay. I can, I can sure help. Thank Sue. you, Steve. Right. And if you have a question, that, there were questions in the chat that I think Mike saw some of them. Yeah. Um, and and they're, they're coming fast and furious there again. Okay. But uh, uh, maybe let's have people raise their hands. Oh, okay. So toward the top right, Steve, we have yeah. um, we have a small four. handful. Um, we have five that we jotted down during the conversation. Can we start with those quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, you know, uh, I see you said you make um, at three D printing. Do you make one attempt to you, uh, reschedule a three D print? Um, what about cost of a failed print? Um, with that, those machines are are, are um, available in a first basis we do have two machines where you um can it doesn't matter which two but the two of them can be reserved um at least 24 hours in advance for print so let's say um you, you're not going to be getting on at work until six o'clock what you could do is you reserve that printer you call ahead we put a sign up make sure that it's available for you um in terms of um so you can attempt as many times as you'd like um with Fail prints if it's a um, machine error, if the machine clogs up, if it's a um, something like that, there's no cost there. Um, most often than not, um, if it's a print that doesn't come out um, right, it's often like if it's a phone case, it's too small or um, something that they made a lot of times in like SketchUp has a design error to it. We do charge for that plastic. If only if our equipment fails in some way, um, then, then we'll take that cost. And um, this question was, what are some examples about what you stopped doing? I think the most important uh, things that we determined we could stop doing uh, were related to programs and how we um, prepare and how we deliver that content to our patrons. Most importantly, we began to understand, first and foremost, that there is expertise and talent out in our community in the form of volunteers community members who have talent and skill and knowledge to share, but maybe have never understood or we've never made it clear to them that we can provide an opportunity and all of the resources and we can create conditions that will allow them to share what they know, what they love, what they're passionate about directly with their neighbors through the library platform. And as we began to do this more and more successfully and had more of our programs and services being community led, that allowed us to kind of think differently about all of our approach to all of our programming. For instance, is it necessary to write a $500 check to a performer during summer learning or does it make more sense to invest in some sustainable reusable resources like STEM kits that we can use over and over and over again in programming. And um, is there an individual or individuals out in the community that would be interested in working with us to deliver exciting and innovative programming during the summer, but who would be interested in doing that on a volunteer basis to give back to the community? So those related to programming, those are some of the areas that we were able to say stop doing things this way and uh, move more towards this community-led, community participant model. And then related to our collections, we did a, a very systematic deep dive into all of our collections. 
and made some determinations, particularly in areas like um, databases and reference material, where we were able to go out and find um, free authoritative information or to put together our own databases that allowed us to free up tens of thousands of dollars to use for what's next, rather than to uh, uh, keep those dollars in place simply because these were dollars that were originally allocated for this type of project. Um, and what brands of sewing machines? We've had the question before with the hand tools. Um, the hand tools are just like books. Um, they don't, they, just as much as a book is likely to walk out your front door. And in actuality, what we found is that we have a lot of hand tools that we never purchased. So people have brought in their hand tools or their things that they want to donate. And we actually have a larger collection now than when we started with. Um, in terms of brand of sewing machines, we've gone through a couple different types. Um, since the, the first ones there, we've moved to a higher, um, uh, more heavier duty model, but they've all been Singer models. Um, Singer Fashion Mates and now Singer um, Heavy Duty. Um, one, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll look at the top here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Steve, we can see some more questions on the screen here. Should we just dive in? Yeah, I copied those from the chat in case you were missed. Awesome, thank you. So uh, there's one question here. You're doing an amazing amount of stuff. What's your staffing like? Uh, well, again, we couldn't do what we do alone as a team or as, as a staff, paid staff team. We're able to, to work at the level that we do and be as productive as we are because we have flung our doors literally wide open to uh, uh, help um, create conditions that allow community members to share their knowledge directly with their neighbors. As Mike was just saying, if we, if, we, if we didn't work that way, none of us on the team would have the knowledge and the skill sets um, that uh, at, at a level to provide uh, access to the community to their ever growing, ever evolving needs. For instance, uh, we might have a few members of the team who are comfortable with coding, uh, but maybe none of us knows how to teach adults Python. But we can provide multiple sessions of um, Python, learn Python at the library, because we can reach out into the community and find people who have that expertise who are willing to share it with their neighbors. Um, so um, our, our staff, uh, our generalists across the board, we make sure that every member, particularly of the professional staff, has the same level of general knowledge as Mike was talking about a little bit earlier in the presentation to be able to help a patron in their moment when they need it. Um, if they need to uh, troubleshoot a machine or to get somebody started, um, any one of us can do that. Um, but uh, oftentimes um, that isn't enough and a patron needs a more customized or more personalized um, uh, interaction with a member of the staff or with a well-trained volunteer. So uh, we, um, we do uh, a tremendous amount of one-on-one -on -one appointments each month. And here, a perfect uh, example, we wouldn't be able to do the number that we do if we didn't have volunteers participating alongside us and bringing those opportunities um, to our, our community. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, Peggy says, "How do you vet uh, your community te uh, tech teachers?" Um, that that process there first starts off with a little application uh, that goes through and is seen by Sue. And um, from that point, then we set up a uh, a little interview. And that may um, that that'll the person that will interview them is usually uh, one of our people on staff. And then part, maybe um, if it's like staff lab, it'll be myself. Um, along in that interview. Uh, what we'll do is we'll ask different questions about their background, what they're looking to, to, to have come out of this uh, volunteering, whether it's them leading the class, if it's them just looking for other like-minded individuals. Um, after that point, we re relay that back uh, to Sue and uh, we move forward from that point if we feel like it's a good fit. Sometimes um, that, that's kind of how we got to the point of our sewers where we had the in the stalls thing. It was a, it was somebody that had this interest 
Um, they filled out this form. They didn't really want to lead a sewing class. They just wanted to find more people like that. And that's where our, our sewing clubs come out of. So we, we let them, um, with our guidance, you know, uh, dictate the way that they want to volunteer. We're really interested in um, uh, creating conditions that allow people who want to share their knowledge to do it in a way that works for them. Um, so each one of these uh, relationships is unique, I think, I, yeah, I think we yeah. can say, Mike. And um, obviously we want to make sure that we don't you know, expose our community to people who um, aren't vetted. Um, so through our interview process we know that we well we feel we do we've had good luck so far knock on wood but we do feel that we ask the kinds of questions that would reveal any red lights or or areas of concern uh, i can't find the docs you mentioned on your website where are they uh jc what i'll do is i'll just really quickly i'll put them on to our uh chat here it's kind of long if um anybody else you can go to ffllib.org Along the top, we're going to have a banner or a menu that says uh, steam and making. If you click on that, it's actually um, one for industry professionals. So this is kind of a funky link um, because it goes right with the name industry professionals here. So let me finish typing this in. To um, uh, uh, point you in the right direction or send you a direct link. And what we can do is, Mike and I will go back and visit the site ourselves later on, and just make sure that everything that we put up here is there. And if and if it isn't, we'll just make sure that Steve has links to everything too, um, and uh, maybe he can include that with the archive. Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, put another W in front. There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. So um, Julia wants to know if we let prints run overnight. Yeah, so uh, we do allow prints to run overnight. Again, it's one um, one printer per person. Uh, we do allow them to be printed overnight. We've had good uh, um, success with that. We do currently use MakerBot machines, um, but yeah. And then um, Simon wants to know, um, for international interested people, how do they get access to um, the Fab Lab, I think that's the question. I would suggest, first things first, visit that website. Visit that learning portal at www.flib.org forward slash make. Yeah. And there you will find um, FAQs that we're constantly adding to as we're interfacing with our colleagues and our peers and they're asking us questions that maybe we haven't answered before and uh, then we uh, load those up into the existing FAQ so that's an ever-growing um, uh, opportunity um, to share uh, for us to share out what we've already been asked and, and, and what we've already addressed um, there's all sorts of resources and links and program ideas and great stuff there so I would suggest starting there and then, of course, you all saw our very first pilot of uh, Mike um, uh, putting together a rough virtual tour of our Fab Lab and our Creation Lab. And we're going to, and we did that quickly, and we did it just for you. So we're going to be working on uh, perfecting that and making it a little bit more professional and uh, making it as comprehensive as possible so that people who can't get to us and come on an innovation tour can go right to our website and have a very similar experience with a virtual tour. So stay tuned and we'll keep working on that. Another question here. Uh, let's see. Is each staff member required to sign up? Or are they volunteers? Well, how, how staff training works for us is we have um, regularly scheduled monthly forums. Um, and we, um, every professional staff member is required to attend those forums. And each one of the forums is around a particular area of service. So each month, the professional staff members are attending a making and steam forum, a program and event forum, an access forum, which is all about collection reference and displays and all those types of things. So at each one of these forums, and there's an, um, one more. IT. 
Yeah, IT, and then uh, there's a uh, the director's meeting yeah. as well, yeah, yeah. right? So, anyways, during any given month, every professional staff member is already scheduled to attend a certain number of forums. So when we see or a staff member suggests that there's an area of training or something that we need to revisit to refresh our skills, we're scheduled into these already scheduled forums. So everyone participates together, whether it's new training or a refresher. Uh, nice idea if we can get that when it's done. Yes, yes, we will we'll make our tour available to anyone who's interested in, in seeing it. And, and we'd love your feedback on it too when we get there. Um, and someone's asking us, uh, what about partnering with persons outside of the US? We do a lot of that. <laughs> or we're, we're, uh, we spend a lot of our time uh, connecting, whether it's through uh, webinars like these, um, uh, for large groups or small groups or people with a, you know, small teams that are interested in getting starting with making or STEM initiatives or whatever it might be. Um, we've um, interfaced with people as far away as Australia and, um, and, and uh, I think pretty much every country in the world at this point. We've had some sort of opportunity to have dialogue and discussion and to share and to learn from them. So um, again, because uh, we want to make sure that we're taking care of our local priorities as well. We did develop that website, which we feel is, is probably the most comprehensive resource of its type. So we hope that, that that's helpful to people from anywhere in the world. And um, the on-site innovation tours have been you know, really well received. And we've had people from all over the world come to Little Fayetteville in upstate New York to come visit our maker spaces and take a tour. And um, once again, right to the heart of your question, uh, we're working on perfecting a virtual tour so that people, regardless of where you are, can um, come and visit with us. Um, uh, someone's asked, Kathy's asking, how many times would each forum be run? Trying to figure out how you stay open but have all these staff forums. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's our highest priority to uh, schedule time to think together and to move forward together. So uh, we don't think of these as, oh geez, you know, another meeting. What we think of these are as our scheduled, um, have a highest priority time. We know each month we're going to be together thinking about every new idea, every new initiative, every uh, continuous improvement effort together. So we, by doing this, having these times scheduled, we avoid having to do all that kind of accessory work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, trying to bring people on board or trying to make sure everybody has the information that they need so no one feels like they're not moving forward with the rest of the team. These forums are critically important to keep uh, the staff nimble and flexible and collaborating and thinking together. So because this is such a high priority for us, we schedule um, uh, support staff members to be taking care of our service desks when we're in those meetings. Um, so um, a, support, a student support staff member, for instance, a graduate student from Syracuse University who typically works a circulation desk might be working reference on one of these days while we're in a forum. And the other really important thing to note about these forums is I don't attend them. If I put myself in the room with all these creative doers, it's going to change the tone and change the outcome of these you know, monthly creative sessions. I want people to take really big risks in their thinking and I want them to be, um, uh, these meetings to be as combative as they need to be and, and to be uh, um, opportunities for peers, for staff to just think out loud. And if I'm in the room, that changes that dynamic. Um, but how I stay informed and how I um, how I uh, uh, am, am uh, um, involved in the process of making sure that proposals that come out of those staff forums are in alignment with our mission and that we have a budget to uh, support them, et cetera, is through monthly staff meetings that I have with each individual member of the profession. So that's that's our chain. That's how it works. Set limit to scale of 40 to 50 hour builds. 
Um, th that's impressive. Um, we have we've had prints that go thirty something hours. Uh, one thing that we wanted to really do right off the bat, we didn't want to um, restrict and, and put policies up to kind of um, kind of hamper or uh, restrict growth of the um, somebody's idea. So what we did. Um, we currently have seven PLA printers. Um, when we first opened, we did not have that many. Um, so we've increased the quantity of printers to meet up with the, the demand for like large prints. So really, and then if it comes down to it still being um, all used, which sometimes they're all in use, uh, we still have that uh, that uh, alternative for people to call ahead, uh, at least the day beforehand, and then they could reserve it. Um, so in our peak times, especially um, during the summer, uh, we see a lot of reservations for those those three prints. Simon, um, yes, please. Um, oh, I'll put it up there. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, there. Um, you'll be. Uh, Simon says here uh, that he is launching uh, Maker Education Alliance Nigeria, acronym MEAN, M E A N, on the 23rd of October. Congratulations. And he says he'll welcome our goodwill message to the participants. Absolutely. Please do. And uh, send people to our website, send people to Mike and I, send them to this archive, and ask them to sign up for SmileCop, smilecop.org, that online, free, informal um, uh, community of practice. And then we have uh, um, weapons. That's actually in our maker agreement. and. Um, um, there's a no weapons to be made in there. Um, it's been something we've maybe said, you know, a handful of times to people. But makers are pretty cool about that. They realize um, uh, they respect all those things. Um, so we do have it in there, though. Yeah. Steve, any other questions that we can answer? It looks like we're at 5:32. I think it's probably time to wrap up. Would is it okay with you if people send you questions to those email addresses? Absolutely. We'd welcome that. Okay. Perfect. So